Prairie Mosaic is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4, 2008. The North Dakota Council on the Arts. And by the members of Prairie Public. Welcome to Prairie Mosaic, a patchwork of stories about the arts, culture, and history in our region. Hi, I'm Barb Gravel. And I'm Bob Dambach. On this edition, we'll listen to poetry read by a state champion, meet a kaleidoscope artist, and enjoy the fresh new sounds of a musician from West Fargo. In 1914, the unthinkable happened in the state of North Dakota. Farmers organized and took control of state politics, implementing the successful program of reforms that led to the state-owned Bank of North Dakota and the state-owned mill. Leading the charge was Minnesota native Arthur C. Townley. Townley is a pretty compelling figure, and I think that's why he's so prominent in, in the memory of those who still think about and remember the Nonpartisan League. Townley offers us, in some ways, an easy way to think about the Nonpartisan League, because if we can understand Townley, this way of thinking goes, we can understand the League. Townley was actually born in Minnesota. He was the eldest, or at least the eldest son of a fairly large family from Browns Valley, Minnesota. And at one time, he would say he was kind of forced out because there are enough kids and not enough work. Anyway, he leaves the nest uh, fairly soon. Ends up around Alexandria, uh, Minnesota, where he uh, does some school teaching and ends up going into business with his brother. And they try farming around Beach, North Dakota, right up against the Montana border. That doesn't work out. He goes to Colorado and tries farming again, and that doesn't work out. And then he comes back to the Beach region, and it looks like he's going to hit the home run and uh, he was gonna have the perfect flax crop. He had borrowed money, he had bought tractors. He was gonna strike it rich. And then um, supposedly uh, there's an early frost and the crop withers and um, the flax king never was the flax king. Everything that he thought he'd built up and was looking forward to, house of cards, it just all falls down. So he decides not to try farming again. he turns towards politics. He floats into the Socialist Party in early 1913. And the Socialist Party is in North Dakota. The Socialist Party has an organization in 1913 in all the states. Townley gets involved in that effort and he immediately develops a reputation within just weeks as someone who can speak to farmers as a former farmer himself. And Townley starts to develop this sales pitch and the sales pitch is largely about what the farmers have wanted and not gotten. And he goes to the Socialist Party leadership back in Minot and says, look, I think I have a way to bring more people into the Socialist Party. These farmers that won't sign up, I think I can figure out how to get them signed up. He's an original recruiter in that he sells socialism light uh, as opposed to true socialism. You can see Marx and Lenin spinning when you, when you talk about Townley and he ultimately gets canned from uh, being a socialist recruiter. Just not exactly what they wanted as a super salesman. Ends up without a job and for reasons that only he could explain, ends up going to watch the 1915 state legislature. And in the process, Townley and some of his friends sit down and start hammering out what they initially call the Farmers Nonpartisan League, which after a while becomes the Nonpartisan League. Now, some commentators on the Nonpartisan League, both at the time and in the period since, have argued that, in fact, Townley offered himself up as kind of a Moses figure to these farmers. In some ways, that's about as much as I want to understand about Arthur Townley, because I don't want to conflate the movement with Arthur Townley. I think that's one of the mistakes that has been made by previous chroniclers of the Nonpartisan League, is that it's so seductive, it's so tempting to let him be the stand-in. 
be the way in which we understand the league and all the parts of it. So I, I don't want to confound you, um, but I don't, I, don't, I don't actually like to go too far with Townley. The NPL, it doesn't work. He uh, tries promoting oil. If he'd been around a few decades later, that might have worked. He also tried some faith healing, which, well, apparently that didn't work too well either. And at some point, he uh, briefly goes to California to uh, attempt to make his stepdaughter a movie star. Ultimately, comes back to North Dakota, becomes very anti-communist. Communists can't lose unless the Republicans wake up, and wake up fast. It speaks out pretty much any time he can get a chance, anti, uh, the anti-communist line, and he's actually preparing to run for Congress when he loses control of his car and uh, he dies. It wasn't a good life. In the years before the League and in the years after the Nonpartisan League, he was endlessly involved in big schemes. And he was definitely a man of great ambition. None of the big schemes ever worked out the way that the League had. Um, but he was constantly in, trying to figure out what the next thing was. In some ways, I like to think of Townley as an entrepreneur, as a person who thinks big, has big ideas, and is willing to put in the time to try to make them happen. Um, and who has some ability to connect with others and convince them that this thing might happen, even though it only worked for him once. He always seems to have wanted to stand in opposition, whether he's standing in opposition to the bankers as he takes out these loans to become not the Flax King, or whether he's standing in opposition to you know, somebody in the legislature who says, go home and slop the hogs. He has to have somebody to tilt at. I think there's a very complex character there. Poetry Out Loud is a competition that encourages students to learn about poetry while they master public speaking skills and build self-confidence. Maria Modituya of Fargo North High School was North Dakota's 2018 State Poetry Out Loud champion. If I speak for the dead, I must leave this animal of my body I must write the same poem. Poetry just helps you in life. Whenever you're struggling in life, poetry helps with that. It helps you kind of get back on track. It's all about the poem and what the author is giving to us. Poetry Out Loud is a competition um, that starts in the um, classroom level. So everybody in the class would choose a poem and they would perform it and whoever won that competition would go to the school level. And so at the school level, whoever wins that then goes on to state, and then whoever wins state goes to nationals. The judges are looking for a certain criteria. They're looking for your presence, your posture, how well you articulate the words, and if you have an interpretation, you know, if you understand it, and then accuracy, if you know your poem. You have to choose your poem from the Poetry Aloud website. One of your poems have to be pre-20th century, and another one has to be under 24 lines, and then the last one is your choice. I wake to sleep and take my waking slow. I feel my fate and what I cannot fear. I learn by going where I have to go. We think by feeling what is there to know. I really, really enjoy performing poetry. Um, I don't know, I, I, I'm a very emotive person because I love making other people feel. And if I could do that, it just brings me joy. Our champion for 2018, Wood Maria Modi. Before I did Poetry Out Loud, I didn't like poetry that much just because it was hard. I was just kind of like, ah, poetry, whatever. I don't get it. But now it's like, wow, Maria has all this knowledge about poetry and she understands it. And it kind of builds my character. 
I would encourage people to participate in Poetry Out Loud because it boosts your confidence and it gives you knowledge and understanding for things that are hard and complex. We have walked in love's land a little way. We have learned his lessons a little while. And shall we not part at the end of day with a sigh, a smile? A little while in the shine of the sun, we were twined together, joined lips, forgot how the shadows fall when the day is done and when love is not. Advice that I would give to somebody thinking about participating in Poetry Aloud is just relax and be natural. You should have passion for your poems that you are delivering. If you don't have that, that will show through your performance. So find passion in your poems and everything else will come. I definitely think poetry is going to be a part of my life throughout going into college and for the rest of my future. It has played such a significant part in my life. When I was younger, I was the shyest person ever. I had like no confidence and poetry was my place. It will live with me for the rest of my life. My poem is Author's Prayer by Ilya Kaminsky. This author is trying to understand how he's supposed to speak for a soldier that has died. He has never experienced that. So how is he supposed to do that? He would have to put himself aside in order to understand this person and their story. Author's Prayer by Ilya Kaminsky. If I speak for the dead, I must leave this animal of my body. I must write the same poem over and over for an empty page as the white flag of their surrender. If I speak for them, I must walk on the edge of myself. I must live as a blind man who runs through rooms without touching the furniture. Yes, I live. I can cross the streets asking, what year is it? I can dance in my sleep and laugh in front of the mirror. Even sleep is a prayer. Lord, I will praise your madness and in the language not mine, speak of music that wakes us, music in which we move. For whatever I say is a kind of petition, and the darkest days must I praise. Growing up, Rodney Howe loved kaleidoscopes. In 1988, he started creating them. Today, he is one of only a handful of kaleidoscope artists in the U.S. When I was a kid, my mom bought me a kaleidoscope and I, I was having fun with it, holding it up to the sun and just digging it. And I thought, I gotta know how this works. So I, I didn't ask permission. I thought better to ask for forgiveness than permission that I went and got a bread knife and it was cardboard. So I just <laughs> sawed the end off of it. And I was just amazed at how simple it is. All you're seeing is a pie-shaped slice of the colored chips that's multiplied by reflection into a circle. Total kaleidoscope artists in the United States, it's, it's in the hundreds of people, but uh, people making the large ones, it's less than 10. And I'm one of the ones that makes big scopes. With the larger scopes, you kind of build them from the inside out. Uh, the mirror system is the heart of the kaleidoscope, so you figure out uh, what size mirrors you want. First uh, measure twice, got it set there. There's all kinds of mirror systems. You can use two mirrors, three mirrors. I like the two mirrors. It just gives you a nice symmetrical pattern. I had to make this myself. Um, that's the thing with kaleidoscope. 
so you can't go to the Kaleidoscope tool store. Now, I would assemble all my components. And what I would do is I would peel this protective surface off. As soon as you peel that protective surface off, dust starts falling out of the air and it starts landing on there. And you'd be surprised uh, at how, how well you can see any dust particle that falls on this stuff. Quickly get this piece in, quickly get this piece in. I have roughly set the gauge here for a 30 degree angle. That gives me a six pointed star pattern. I would very quickly set the flat black surface. That's the third side of the mirror tube. I would put the weights on. Once I've got my mirrors set, then I would put the end glass against each end of the mirror tube, and I would use a silicone glue to just dab glue in about five different places to tack it. Then I walk away for about six hours and don't even touch it. Then I come back and go with a bead of glue and seal all every seam on there. The object chamber is generally the chamber that tumbles around the colored pieces that form the kaleidoscopic image. We need to fit these glass lenses for an object chamber that I'm working on. I'm just a hair too big. So we're gonna take my poor old ancient glass grinder here, wet down the bit a little bit for cooling, and we're just gonna take the high spots off the corner or off the edge of the glass here. Ta-da! If you have an object chamber, one piece of glass is clear and the front piece of glass is opaque. The reason for that is you don't want to look down your mirrors through your colored chips and then see what's beyond the scope. This uh, diffuses the light so that all you see is that wonderful snowflake pattern. The reason I like the larger scopes is because they give you a, a huge pattern most of the time. It, it, the pattern you see looks you know, about this big and it's out about a foot in front of you. Uh, my larger scopes will give you a pattern that seems like it's almost a foot to cross. That's just real visually striking. It's real easy to make a, a kaleidoscope. It's real hard to make one that's really good. I know it sounds artsy, fartsy, but I do it because I like to do it. And I figure if I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna do it well and see if I can find some collectors to collect my well-built kaleidoscopes. If I can't, then I'm gonna make them anyway. I got more room in the back, I can put them back there. But they find a home. There's always somebody that wants them. We're gonna just take these strips of glass, heat them up until they get to be about the consistency of taffy and then we're just going to bend them and twist them around a little bit to come up with little shapes oh, like that. We're going to fire up the torch here. The trick in a chamber like this is to use enough clear pieces so that it holds the colored pieces apart a little bit. I found that this is more art than anything else. You, you just have to experiment with it and see what works. Those glass blowers that talk about that power over the glass to make it something, you know. Uh, I don't know if it's quite that dramatic here, but yeah, it's neat. Glass is supposed to be brittle and, and crack. And when you can make it soft and flowing and then make it into these nifty curly Q shapes, uh, it's, it's just fun. And then uh, it just happens to work really well for a kaleidoscope object chamber. This is the largest object chambers that I've ever made. Uh, it's a nine inch diameter object chamber. It's an oil filled chamber. I think you can see that there when I turn it. Uh, it's filled with a 10,000 weight silicone oil. And these colored pieces are what I was just lamp working. That's an example of lamp worked glass. With the bigger ones, it's just, just the wow factor. The ones out at West Acres, uh, people literally line up to look at them and and just hearing all the oohs and the ahs and the wows, I just get a kick out of it. It just gives me a little thrill. So that's, that's the inspiration. Kwaisian Trailer is a hardworking musician who calls West Fargo his home. Born and raised, however, in Chicago, he's convinced that moving to North Dakota was part of his life's path. His inspirations stem from a great range of musical genres, but his own unique style can be found in each composition. I'm Kwaisian. I'm from Chicago, Illinois. Born and raised there. I live in West Fargo now. There's this song 
Oh, with lyrics, it says, um, love can change the world in a moment. And it can, that's what it's all about. That's the purpose of life. It's not that hard, it's just love. Even the fact that I'm doing it because I love it is spreading love to me, showing an example to someone else. Do what you love to do and that's, that's how you'll be able to spread it. You know, your work will no longer be work when you love to do what you're doing. in dark days Gotta focus on my hustle and my grind Living in dark days Through the spirit and the music I'll be fine Living in dark days One thing is pressure in my mind Living in dark days Living in dark days Lord knows I've been trying I've been trying hold my ground I got a love so strong can't deny it and if I lose my head I don't think I survive it no no run no hard times nothing like it no losing my family and friends supposed to stick to the end but I doubt it no no I've been petrified running these streets late at night I got a target on my back, yeah, I'm under attack, and I know it ain't right, but we're living in dark days. Gotta focus on my hustle and my grind, living in dark days. Spirit and the music, I be fine, living in dark days. One thing is pressure in my mind, living in dark days, living in dark days. I've been lying, and it ain't the little white ones y'all been buying. No, no, I can't hide no more. Gotta stay true to myself. But if I tell you, I can't have you telling no one else. No, no, living in dark days. Gotta focus on my hustle and my grind. Living in dark days. Spirit and the music, I'll be fine. in my mind, living in dark days, living in dark days. Focus on my 
If you know of an artist, a topic, or an organization in our region that you think might make for an interesting segment, please contact us at prairiemosaic at prairiepublic.org. I'm Bob Danback. And I'm Barb Gravel. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Prairie Mosaic. Prairie Mosaic is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4, 2008, the North Dakota Council on the Arts, and by the members of Prairie Public.